So welcome, uh, I'm James Rowe, consultant neurologist here at Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge where we have a specialist clinic for patients and families affected by frontotemporal dementia and related disorders. We also undertake the neuropsychological memory testing here uh, and also any initial investigations. So our work here focuses on frontotemporal dementia and in particular the behavioural variant of frontotemporal dementia that causes a change of personality and behaviour including impulsivity that is a particular risk to the patients but also a particular cause of stress and burden to their carers and families. So our approach is to try and understand the biology underlying personality and behavioural control and impulsivity. These areas across the front of the brain and the underneath side, the orbitofrontal cortex, show most areas of atrophy and it includes areas here on the, the inferior lateral sides of the brain that are particularly important for controlling and regulating behaviour, for inhibiting responses or delaying and refraining from behaviour. And damage here or shrinkage here will lead to disinhibition and impulsive behaviours. This frontal area of the brain is not only shrunk, but it is also very low in the chemical serotonin. And one of the particular functions is inflexible and adaptive behaviour and enabling us to inhibit our responses and to delay or prevent action until it's the right time or the right action. The, the brainstem here in the dorsal raphe is where the, all, all the brain's uh, serotonin is naturally made and has long vulnerable projections that send serotonin through showering the frontal parts of the brain. The key thing about this region is its importance for behavioural control, inhibition and flexibility. And the rationale for the study was to use citalopram to boost the serotonin levels and to help this part of the brain do its job better. This is the Medical Research Council Cognition and Brain Sciences Unit. I'm one of the lead authors of the paper and I ran all of the experiments here in our MEG lab. Okay, so this is our MAG. The system that we have has um, an array of 306 gradiometers and magnetometers and they measure the magnetic fields generated by the electrical signals in the brain. We're also using an EEG cap, 70 electrode EEG cap, um, which records the voltage fluctuations. On the screen you can see this is the action inhibition task that we're using. It's a very classic go-no-go -no -go task. You can see there's a series of O's which set up a prepotent response which needs to be inhibited during a no-go trial. In this case, when a letter X appears. When we look at the results from the healthy controls, particularly focusing on those successful no-go trials, we can see occipital cortical activity, which is not surprising because this is a visual task, but we can also see this anterior prefrontal cortical activity and temporal lobe activity. And it's these regions which show reduced activity in the patients with frontotemporal dementia. But of particular interest was what happens when we give them a citalopram tablet. And we showed that it's this region here, the right inferior prefrontal gyrus, that showed an increased activation after taking that single dose. So here we have the EEG results from those successful no-go trials in the healthy control group. You can see that the no-go trials have a very classic signature of a P2, N2 and a P3. These have been very much enhanced for the no-go trials compared to the GO trials. When we compare the patients with the controls, we can see that they have a reduced P2, N2 and P3 components, showing reduced activations, despite the fact that these are the successful no-go trials for the patients. So when we compare the placebo with the citalopram session, we can see that the citalopram has an effect on the P3 here, restoring it almost to the same level as the controls. One of the broader agendas of, of this study is in repurposing drugs, in taking drugs that have a very well-known safety profile, but have been thought of or used in one very narrow context. For example, the serotonin reuptake inhibitors are almost synonymous with depression and anxiety treatment in practice, but that's missing their potential. There are some important caveats it's worth bearing in mind. I think this is not a clinical trial. We want to take this forward towards clinical trials, looking for long-term benefits, sustained benefits on daily treatment over, over a long period. Um, and also to really prove the impact it has on day-to-day -day function and risk. One of the really important parts of the study was to be able to show that this rather constrained, almost artificial task that we can conduct in the laboratory correlated significantly with the day-to-day -day reports of impulsive behaviours from families, uh, people speaking out of turn, taking food off other people's plates, cloth crossing the road without looking. And I think there's a lot we need to learn about the relationship between these experimental tasks 
and everyday behaviours that would really strengthen the ability to bring forward effective treatments in the way that patients and their families would want.